Uh, thank you for that introduction. It is a pleasure to be able to spend some time with you today. Uh, thank you, Alabama FFA, for having me. Uh, as they said in my introduction, my, my FFA connection is strong. Let me just tell you a little bit more about that, though. You know, I grew up on a, on a pig farm uh, outside of a town of about 900 people. My dad was actually my ag teacher. Can you imagine that, right? Uh, going to school and, and, your, and, your, and your ag teacher is your parent, and then going home, boom, they're there as well. Uh, but best dad I've ever had, taught ag for 30 years, uh, and I have, I have the pleasure really, uh, everywhere, whether it's in front of an FFA audience or not, uh, to say that my, uh, pretty much my leadership development was just embodied in my experience through agriculture, through ag ed, through FFA, and it is not just because uh, I'm working with the Alabama FFA today uh, that I say that I hold the uh, pretty much every degree you can have in the FFA. Uh, I started with the um, green hand degree, and then the chapter degree, and then the state degree, and then the American FFA degree, and then the honorary state degree, and then the honorary American degree. I mean, I am down with the F to the F to the hey, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so uh, my, my blood only turns red when I don't need it anymore. It's blue and gold on the inside, right? Uh, to put it even more succinctly, let's, let's put it this way. From the words of Erwin Milton Tiffany, written in 1928, I believe, right, in the future of agriculture. Uh, with a faith born not of words, but of deeds. Achievements won by the present and past generations of agriculturists in the promise of better days through better ways, even as the better things we now enjoy have come to us from the struggles of former years. Can I get an amen, Alabama FFA? I can't hear you, but I know that you're saying it. So let's just begin, obviously, with I, I have an almost illegal love of the F to the F today. Fafa, as we pronounce it in Oklahoma. And it is an honor to be able to share my message of really how to cultivate your leadership skills uh, through your experiences as an FFA member, as an FFA supporter, as an advisor, um, whatever your role is as you're watching this, this keynote and this message, it's an honor to be able to share my message with you about how to really live to serve. So the question that we're going to begin with is, with the message today, is really how, how do I make an impact as a leader? How do I make an impact as a leader? And we're going, to look at, we're going to look at three things today that really, I believe, um, are the most powerful answers to that question. How do I make an impact as a leader? Uh, now, I'm a huge music fan, all right? From the state of Oklahoma, got a lot of famous musicians from Oklahoma. Uh, let's begin with Garth Brooks. You may have heard of him. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, Brooks and Dunn, the Dunn of Brooks and Dunn. Reba McIntyre, Toby Keith, any of these ringing a bell? Right? And so I'm a huge fan of music. And I love to start my keynote messages with referring to one of my favorite artists. His name is Carlos Santana. Now, he's not from Oklahoma, Carlos Santana. Uh, and you may not know the name, but Carlos Santana is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And the life of Carlos Santana really uh, embodies our first answer to how do I make an, how do I make an impact as a leader? Um, Carlos, who is now 74 years old, I believe, as of 2020, okay? Uh, Carlos Santana has been a professional musician since 1969, all right? That's 50 plus years this guy's been doing his work, and he is at the top of the mountain uh, when it comes to famous guitarist, Carlos Santana. Google him, okay? Well, Carlos was interviewed a couple of years back, and he was interviewed by this gentleman named Dan Rather. Now, Dan Rather, okay, you got a brief explanation of Carlos. Dan Rather, really the best way to explain him, old, boring, white guy. Okay, that's Dan Rath. He was a news uh, caster for years and years and years. And Dan has a show called The Big Interview. Right, it's on Access Television. You got to check it out. I mean, if you've 
If you've never watched Dan Rather interview Kid Rock for 90 minutes, you haven't lived, all right? So, so, so Carlos Santana was on Dan's show, one of, the, one of his episodes. And what Dan likes to do is he likes to interview uh, his, his guests, right? Like, kind of like this, you know, Dan, you, questions, answers, bada bing, bada bing. Then he'll go on stage before one of the shows and interview the, the, the artist, right, in their zone. And he did this with Carlos. And he asked a lot of questions. One of the questions that Dan asked Carlos Santana was, how do you do it? How do you still get on stage after 50 years of doing your work? How do you still get on stage and give it your best, right? How do you do that? And Carlos's answer was very insightful and connects to the question of how do you make an impact as a leader? And what Carlos said was, Dan, I'm able to still give my best as a musician every day for 50 years because I'm grateful. He said, I'm grateful for my band. I'm grateful for this crew that sets up the stage. I'm grateful for the audience. I'm grateful for my talent. He said, Dan, you can't decide to be happy. You can't decide to be joyful. Those aren't decisions you can make. Those are byproducts of something else. And he said, Dan, the way that I'm able to still have happiness and joy in my work, in influencing others, is I'm grateful. I choose to be grateful. And my gratefulness then allows me to be happy and to have joy. Isn't that awesome? You can't decide to be happy, but you can decide to be grateful. What are you grateful for? To be a leader who is able to make an impact, you have to step back and say, what am I grateful for? Particularly in these times, right? We all have struggles that's going on, but what are we grateful for? And to keep that front of mind, that's the number one answer in my mind to how can we be leaders? How can you be a leader? that can really make an impact on others. You gotta decide and know and keep in front of you, what are you grateful for? So the second way that we are able to be leaders who make an impact after we decide and keep in front of us what we're grateful for uh, is really encompassed again in actually a story from a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Jason Kruska. Now, I'm a graduate of Oklahoma State University, go Pokes. I graduated there in 1996, and Jason and I went to college together. We took different paths. I've been, a prof I've been speaking since the age of two. I've been doing it professionally since 1999. But Jason's path took him to Berkeley, where he got his master's and then his PhD. And Jason went to work for a little organization you may have heard of called NASA, right? And lived down south of Houston and worked for NASA. And I want to make sure that I get this right. Jason's job title. Okay, you ready for this? This is a very long business card. Jason's title is NASA Flight Operations Directorate Verification and Validation Lead. Did you get that? Yeah, I don't know what it means either. Okay, but yeah, NASA Flight Operations Directorate Verification and Validation Lead. What does it mean? Well, here's what it means. Jason uh, was in charge of two things for NASA, right? First of all, Jason was in charge of the team of engineers that were working on the communication elements for the Orion spacecraft. Now you can Google this later. The Orion spacecraft is basically, uh, its mission is to take astronaut to Mars in orbit around Mars by 2040. All right, that's what the Orion spacecraft is purposed for. And Jason was the team leader in charge of all these really smart engineers that are making sure that all of the communication math was in order so that the astronauts could communicate back with, with, with the uh, uh, NASA professionals back on here on planet Earth. But the other thing that Jason was in charge of was called the book. Okay, it's called the book because it's uh, got multiple pages and it's got binding. It's a book, but this book is a special book. It's the only book 
that has to be verified by NASA professionals all the way from where Jason worked, okay, uh, all the way up to the top NASA brass in Washington, D.C. Now, what's in the book? The book is a rec holds a record, okay, of every piece of communication Okay, from all of the assets that NASA has on planet Earth to all the assets they have in outer space. Every single one of them. Jason was in charge of the team that put this together and made sure that it was correct. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you ever hang around people that have an opinion, that always think their opinion is right? you ever hang around people who think they're the smartest person in the room? You ever hang around people who, if you, if they want your opinion, they will give your opinion to you, right? Imagine being in charge of a large number of people that all fit in that category. That was Jason's job, right? Now, some more things you should know about Jason. He was always on time for work. He rarely expressed frustrations. He always made time to talk to people. He always carried a smile on his face. This is very important information because the other thing you need to know about my friend Jason is that at the age of 14, Jason, in a freak bicycle accident, became a paraplegic. From the age of 14, my friend Jason lived in a wheelchair, had no use of his legs, had no use of his arms, only could use two of his fingers on one of his hands. My friend Jason. Now let's go back. What did I say about Jason? I said not only did he have a very complicated, very stress-filled job, right? But the more important thing is, I said, even as a paraplegic, he was never late to work. He rarely expressed frustrations. He always had a smile on his face. Always had time to talk to people. Even within that physical condition that he had. So what is Jason teaching you? Jason is teaching you that if you want to be a leader who makes an impact, then you take what you've been given and you make the absolute most of it. You make the absolute most of it. Whatever you've got, whatever your strengths are, whatever your weaknesses are, you've got to step back and say, this is who I am. This is what I've been given. Right? And I'm going to make the absolute most of it. So leaders are not only grateful to make an impact on others, but if you're really going to make an impact on others, you've got to be someone who takes what you've been given you to make the most of it. So let's take a look now at the third element that I believe is vitally important if you're going to be a leader that's really able to make a strong impact. We're grateful for uh, the people and the situations and the gifts we have in our life. We make the most of what we've been given. But this third piece, man, it really is critically important. And this story that I'm going to share with you actually has to do with this tennis ball and has to do with the guy that you've been staring at for the last 15 minutes. Um, in 2014, I was diagnosed with a tennis ball sized brain tumor. Now, the brain tumor, which I've named Wilson, I know, something is wrong with me. If we met in person, you would know that quickly. But the brain tumor uh, was removed in September of 2014. And a week after it was removed, uh, we learned that it was benign, which means no cancer. So we go back to that gratefulness lesson, right? Very grateful for that. Um, but the point has really nothing to do with me. It has to do with a friend of mine. You see, um, when I was diagnosed with the brain tumor, and that was in late August of that year, and as a professional speaker, I mean, I'm out on the road all the time. And between September and December, every year, now for 20 years, I could earn 60% of my income just in those few months. Well, I wasn't going to be able to be on the road at all any of those months. So three of my friends stepped up and told my family and I, even before the surgery happened, they said, Rhett, 
we're going to go and do all of your speaking engagements for you. And you just pay our expenses, and we will gift you all of that income. That's what they said. Three of my friends. Now, it's good to have friends. It's good to be grateful for your friends. It's good to make the most of your friends. Uh, but when you have friends like that, wow, they're pretty powerful. So fast forward to the end of 2014, and in the start of 2015, I was able to get back to work. And one of those three friends went on a speaking engagement with me. And I was back to driving in. I couldn't drive during most of those months because my eyesight was damaged from the uh, brain tumor, from the surgery. But I was back driving, and my friend went with me. And he went with me to a, to a breakfast meeting that I was speaking at. And he was sitting all the way in the back, and he just was there being present, wanted to be with his, with his good friend, Rhett. And halfway through my presentation, I saw him get up and, and walk out of the room, right? And I was like, well, that's a good friend. He just got up and left, didn't get on his phone, nothing, he just walked out of the room. So I didn't think anything of it. I finished my presentation, bada boom, bada bing. And uh, then I, I walked out into the foyer, one of my favorite words, Walked out in the foyer of, of the hotel where the where the meeting was, and my friend was sitting there, and, and uh, you know we loaded up in my in my truck and and got on the interstate, and I and I asked him, I said I said uh, hey hey I, I saw you get up and, and walk out of the room about halfway through the through the presentation, why did you do that? And he said, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I said, well, what do you mean? And as he started to answer that question, what do you mean by that? The tone of his voice dropped and got to a level that I'd never heard him speak in before. I mean, seriously, I've known this man for 20 years. One of my best friends, I've never, so I knew whatever he was getting ready to share was going to be pretty powerful. Matter of fact, I was getting on the on-ramp, right, to the interstate. And I pulled over on the shoulder of the on-ramp because I needed, and I parked, I needed to hear and give my full attention to what he was getting ready to say. And here's what he said. He said, man, I had to get up and walk out of the room. And I couldn't take it anymore. Because what you don't know, Red, is a couple of months before Wilson was discovered, before they found your brain tumor, I was this close to commit suicide. This close. And I, I didn't I didn't know that about him. He was he was hiding that, obviously, from everyone. And he said, Rhett, when Wilson happened, and you needed my help and the other two guys' help to go out and do all those speaking engagements for you. And I was out there on the road for hours doing all that work for those three, four months, just out of love for you, and earning no income for it, just, just doing it because I love you. It changed my mind about committing suicide. And it just floored me. I mean, people had always asked, you know, whenever the brain tumor was discovered, and for those few months after, why do you think this is happening, Red? You know, what do you think caused the brain, you know, the brain tumor? And, and I didn't know. And one of my good friends is an oncologist who's a cancer expert, and he told me, Red, you're never going to know exactly what caused the brain tumor. But you know, the other element behind those questions is, what, what do you think is the purpose of a brain tumor being in your story, in your life, right? What do you, why do you think it happened? And I really didn't know until that morning and when my friend told me that. And what I'm saying to you is the reason why this pain was in my life and in my family's life and the reason why I went through these struggles was because it provided an opportunity for other people to serve. Something you may not have thought about when it comes to pain and struggles that we have in our lives is that pain creates an opportunity for you to serve. Matter of fact, on the back of every Wilson that I take to all my presentations, it says, live to serve. You see, our first lesson in this message 
was about being grateful. The second message is about making the most with what you're grateful for. And the third lesson, if you're going to make an impact, a real impact on other people, you've got to live a life of service. You've got to live to serve. You see, my friend rediscovered his purpose in life, changed his mind about taking his life because he was serving. Because it re-fired his motivation, if you will, to serve others. Am I grateful that I had a brain tumor? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why? Because my good friend may not be here today with us if that wouldn't have happened. So the lesson for you, who are you serving? Who are you helping every day? Who is going through pain that the reason why they're going through that pain and they're having those struggles is because it provides you an opportunity to serve them and to help them and to live to serve. You're grateful, you make the most of what you've got, and you live to serve, and you're going to be making an impact as a leader. And the strong FFA connection to the live to serve you've already picked up on, I'm sure, is in our FFA motto, right? Learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, and living to serve, right? It's what we are about. Man, I believe in the future of agriculture with a faith born not of words, but of deeds. The achievements one, by the present and past generations of agriculturalists in the promise of better days through better ways, even as the better things we now enjoy have come to us from the struggles of former years. Good luck, Alabama FFA. Good luck, members. I wish you the best. Thanks for having me.